Hello, I'm Russell Hill, editor of Trout Fisherman magazine, and I'm here on a cold early season day at Eleanor Trout Fishery in Northamptonshire. I'd like to welcome you to the new Airflow DVD Modern Stillwater Tactics, involving two of the nation's top anglers, namely Airflow's very own Gareth Jones and, of course, former world champion Ian Barr. We hope that the lessons learned in this DVD help you catch more trout. Welcome to the latest instalment of Modern Fly Fishing Tactics. We are today at Ibrook Reservoir, which is a lovely mid-sized still water in the Midlands, and hopefully we're going to bring you a lot of good top of the water action. Well, we've got some cracking conditions today. We've got a nice pin ripple, and we've got overcast skies, which should make it perfect for dry fly. But you never know, the fish will always have the last say in this, so we'll keep our minds open and uh, try the dry fly, and if not, we'll go a little bit deeper. I don't know if you can see it, but off the back of the boat here, we've got a lovely calm slick. It's about three feet wide and it's about 200 yards long. Now that calm water is going to collect the food and the fish are going to come up it like a highway. I've just missed one in it now, just short line in the dry flies, put in one on each edge of it and one in the middle. And a lovely big head came over, but I'm, I, I was a little bit sharp on him and pulled it out before he could, could turn over on the fly. But I'm sure there'll be more as we continue down this drift. No, nothing. Okay, let's work that slick. Seeing the odd fish here now. Just keeping everything short so I can see any, t any sign of a take. No need to cast too far. Casting too far would dry, especially in a little bit of a ripple creates too much drag on the flies so you get a lot of takes which which aren't real takes they'll boil at the fly and they won't eat it properly whereas short line slack line into the system rod tip quite high a couple of things with the rod tip high one is that obviously it's creating slack but secondly it stops you from over striking if you've only got a short distance left to strike you can't give it the big lick and uh, and crack off on those fish so I always like to keep stop the rod short bounce the flies back on themselves Watch my dries land and then see them a little drift away. Wait for another take. Well, I've just come pulled back up the wind to see if I can get a fish, and I've just hooked a much better fish. Um, went over the went over the fly once and I missed him, <laughs> and I dropped the flies back into the holes and he came back again. I'm just going to get this from the reel because I think it's quite a decent fish. I don't want to, oh. <laughs> I'm only on a light five weight rod. Uh, I'm working on a, developing a new rod for like top of the water techniques for the season. Uh, <laughs> and it's working a treat on these fish. <laughs> Got up behind me. It's a long way back. Let's see if I can coax him back down the wind. <laughs> Don't pull too hard. Just try and change the angles a little bit, see if you can get him to move back towards you. Oh, it's a good fish. That is a good fish. Well, that's a lovely clean fish. You can see this one's been in quite a while. It's already bloomed up in the tail. Uh, took a large claret hopper, one of my favorite flies. Size 10, big old hackle on it, uh, but slim at the back end, something to bite in. Uh, he actually came over the middle drop at first, and I just represented. He said, I didn't scare him as I lifted off, just gentle lift off, dropped it back into the, where he'd risen, and he went straight over the claret, which he'd uh, obviously the second fly he'd seen. So. I think what we should do is just take a look and see what this one's been feeding on. Now, I know we're catching fish, but it's often a good idea to take a look what they've been feeding on. Now this one's gonna go in the pot, so I don't mind killing one now and again, but let's have a look what he's got in his mouth. Sometimes you gotta get it right and see, oh, here we go, stacked full of food. Let me put him down, take a look what we've got here. Okay, we've actually got fry, we've got corixa, we've got a little shield beetle, 
but main, the main source obviously is the Crixa, a lot of little yellow belly Crixa there, and a, a decomposed fry, so that's been in there quite a while. And this large shield beetle, which you, you do get at the back end of the season, you see a few of these popping around. So he's pretty much stacking up for the back end. He's, he's in the weed beds here, and he's eating on whatever went past. My little 14 bits was obviously a good Crixa pattern. Uh, missed him on that, and then he thought, well, that big hopper was going to be a nicer meal. Unfortunately, it didn't work out like that. Well, I've got quite a harsh white light on, on this side of the boat where I'm casting to, and the dark flies are really showing up in it. So it's an important point. If you, It's important you see the takes, otherwise you're not going to set the hook. So that little cull wing really standing out in this side. The boat partner on the far side has got lovely soft light, very easy to see fish. And uh, if I was in a match today, I'd certainly want to be on the pointy end of the boat. But we'll stick it out up here and see what we can get. The one thing I've noticed with dry fly is it does help sort out some of the better fish. A lot of the times fish have been caught and released and they get used to movement. Whereas when you're fishing static, there's nothing really to scare them. So it's a very, very effective way of getting out those uh, grown on fish. When I want my flies to pop up right on the surface when you're fishing adults or terrestrials, daddy long legs, that sort of thing, then I'll treat my flies with desiccant first get the powder, get everything really, really dry, then I'll treat them with um, a regular dry fly dressing. Any of the gels, just work that into the fibers. Well, I've got a lovely slick out in front of me. Only trouble is we've got the boat coming up the side of it, which is probably gonna scare a few fish. One of the things when you're out in the boat is, is give your, your fellow anglers a wide berth, you know? And when you are going past them, just tick over rather than going a full pelt. It'll um, leave the fish and a little bit calmer mode and leave other anglers catch a few more of them. And coming up the other slick as well, Pete. Oh, I can't quite get his head up with this short, long meter. There you go. Yeah. You see, we come out in open water, much smaller stamp of fish, whereas those fish in the edges were the big guys. Welcome all or less, but um, one is going to go back ready for next year. Get the hook out, pop him back. There you go. When we're fishing in shallow water, like we were stoke dry, I prefer not to use the drogue. The drogue goes through the water column and scares a lot of fish. But when you're out in open water and the wind's picking up, the drogue is a huge advantage, giving you much better control over your, over your flies and your drift. When I set up my drogue, I fix it at two points, one up by the, the front seat, one at the back seat. But if you adjust the length of the rope that's out on each side, you can actually change the direction in which you drift, giving you a much better control of where you're going to end up. If you shorten one end, the boat will drift towards that end. If you shorten the, at the stern, it's going to drift towards the stern. If you, if you shorten at the bow, it's going to drift towards the bow. So if you're coming onto shallows or you want to avoid a point or come out into deeper water, just adjust the length of the rope slightly and it'll change your angle of, uh, of direction. Oh. <laughs> well, we've come across the middle here and there's a few slicks forming. And um, I like to work the slicks. We've got the drogue out to slow us down. And you can just see a little flat spot in front of the boat. And I'm just flicking the dries out there. And um, this little guy, he's come up and he's taken the cull de canard, the sight on the top dropper. Took it sweet as a nut. Only trouble is he's going to tangle me up. But uh, let's get him in. Let's get this one in the net. Uh, and we'll probably take a look. Oh. Get him in the net first. So he's taken a little fiery brown flat back 
cracking little fish nice and clean well I'm going to reset my leader and as you know I've got a pod leader on the end and to that I'm going to attach about five feet of um, tippet to my first fly and then about six foot apart from the other two uh, on the top dropper I've got um, a CDC flat back little fiery brown a little bit of flash a couple of legs on it nothing too fancy in the middle I've got a little parachute fiery brown bits which is catching a few fish and that's what caught the last one and on the point I've got this lovely UV ribbed dark claret hopper now in this light this this uh, every time the cloud goes over that UV just just bursts out of the fly and uh, I think that's a real attraction this in this light so my knots I'm gonna use I'm gonna use um, a three turn water knot but what I'm gonna do is on is after the second turn I'm actually going to turn uh, the dropper on the back side of the loop. I'll show you that in close-up detail, but I think it uh, creates a much smoother knot, uh, and certainly in my tests, it's giving me a bit of higher braking strain. So I'll do that in close-up, but let me uh, get my leader sorted and we'll see if we can catch a few more of these nice fish. Well, I've reset the leader. Got it all set, working well again. Degreased it, which I think is, is critical, especially in this variable light when the sun comes out. You can just see the fish, they're not taking the fly very well uh, and they've definitely seen the leader uh, but if you can just get under, well you can maybe convert a few of those takes. I've even greased up the CDC, uh, just lightly put some uh, floating in your fingers and just work it back into the fibres just gently and it'll keep that popped up really well and that's my visual, my visual sight there. A lot of people think you need to see all three flies and it's it's quite difficult to do that, especially when you're fishing some quite small patterns. Whereas that CDC just draws my eye every time. And if I see a rise in line with that, that, that CDC in the fly line, it's gonna be for me. You know, there's not a lot of fish rising, fish are coming blind. So I'll set the hook on that. Um, and nine times out of 10 is definitely gonna be my fish. Whereas if you're on a calm day and you can see the fish running up the wind and you're putting it in front of them, then you know they've eaten your fly. That's a, a different ball game. You wanna see a fly in that, but in this the blind dries in all honesty two of them can be blind as long as you see one of them and you see a rise anywhere near it from behind just set the hook they're going to be there going dry fly fishing is like taking your chemistry set fishing you really want to get your fly line to float high now it doesn't matter what manufacturer's lines you're using you need to grease the line grease the fly line grease the pole leader but if you can get that fly line to stay high in the surface it lift off crisper and help you set the hooks more easily. Putting a lot of line between me and it, that one. Come over the top dropper. I just missed a couple in that sunshine. And I think what was happening was they were coming up and charging the, the fly and turning away at the last minute. So I wasn't really getting them. And the cloud came over and a lovely head and tail over the the top dropper. Oh, that's a fast fish. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's off. Like a little bonefish going there. Oh, I can see why there's a good looking tail on the back end of that one. There's a nice fish. Oh. Careful, don't play it too hard. These fine wire hooks can get a little springy on you. And when you do get those better fish, they can really put some punishment on those hooks. Whoa, cracking fish. <laughs> Please to keep your hand away from the reel every now and again when you think they're gonna run. Well, as you can see, there's another cracking fish. Uh, obviously it's been stocked at the start of the season and the condition of these fish is a real testament to iBrook's capabilities. It's such a rich water, so diverse with the food, it just grows these fish on like little torpedoes. And uh, another cracking fish. Well as you can see I'm, I'm coming into the bank here but I'm coming up at real slow speeds. Very important. See a lot of guys on the water will, will catch a few fish and when they want to go back round, they'll just charge back round to full throttle 
and drop themselves back in the same spot. Now, that's all very well, but if you're fishing for good fish, you're going to scare them away. So what you'll see I've done is I've taken a big arc around, gone back to the top of the wind, nice and gentle, and now I can go back over that, those fish without disturbing them, and hopefully get another couple of chances. Just want to give the drogue a little tug. I'm in shallow water, and it's getting caught on the bottom, so for us to keep free drifting, just lift it up out of the weed. I just want to get on the edge of this drop off where the fish are holding. And I can see the weed, and I can see it drop off into about five or six feet, and the fisher must be running up and down that edge, just cruising around looking for corixa and other bits of fry and whatever they're going to find is going to be looking in that, uh, looking close to that area. All I'm looking to do now is drop my dry flies off the edge of it. Any cruising fish is just going to come up and uh, nail them. The other thing as well with the weed beds is it acts as a bit of a filter. So you can actually hide yourself in the weed bed without the fish seeing you. So it's, it's a great little ambush technique. One of the biggest problems with dry fly fishing is having your tippet float on the surface. Now fluorocarbon is fine at sinking, but what, what happens is, is that when you're trying to drift the flies, copolymer is far better to try and get those flies to, to act more naturally on the surface. Downside is, is it doesn't cut through the film. So by taking some mud mixture of washing up liquid and uh, fuller's earth and just rub it through your leader regularly, that'll help it to cut through and stop the fish from being scared of your tippet. Oh, that was close to the boat. I, I'd raised the fish earlier, dropped it back on him, and he's hit, eaten it right in tight on the on the edge of the boat there. Again, he's gone over the claret hopper. Now, it's a dull day, and this fly's got a, a UV rib on it, and it really stands out against the claret underbody, and they've really taken a liking to it. Having said that, when you are dry fly fishing, nine times out of ten, the fish are going to come on the point fly. If you imagine, there's only one strand of tippet attached to it, with your droppers, there's a lot of things going on there, with a lot of things that can scare the fish, whereas with a point fly, it's uh, <laughs> probably something going under this engine. Yeah, it's, it's only got one piece of tippet anywhere near it, so there's nothing behind it to frighten them. So, a lot of times, another really clean fish. That's a cracker. That's a cracker. Keep that up. Oops. There you go. That's another couple of minutes. <laughs> Lovely fishing on a pleasure day with a light gear, although. Uh, Sometimes they do boss you about a bit. Oh, let's get his head up, head up, head up, head up. Oh, yes. Cracking fish. And this one's another clean fish. Again, that claret hopper. Ooh, absolute speed in it. Another one in the claret hopper. Bang on. One of my favourite flies. Let's check this guy out, see what he's got inside him. Quick look in with a spoon. Get it right in there and give it a good turn round. Let's see what we've got. Oh, <laughs> a single stickleback. You must have just come on the feed, started feeding this morning. Just took a stickleback, couldn't see anything else in there. And uh, obviously my hopper got in the way. Well, today we've used quite a variety of patterns. Um, in the shallows, we're using little small culled canard patterns uh, with bright red sails fur, which was really pulling up on the, on the crixa feeders. And then in the open water, when the fish were a little bit more Catholic of their taste, using bigger patterns, stuff that we could see in the wave. Um, the CDC top dropper was a, a little fiery brown, little bit of amber mix in the, in the seals for size 12, but something I could really easily see and pick up in that wave. In the middle, I had a little um, parachute, a little fiery brown parachute. And on the point, one of my favorite flies, a big claret hopper. Now I like to tie the claret hopper with a, a blue UV rib. And I find it in these conditions when you've got that overcast sky, it really lifts that fly up and drags the fish onto it. And they were absolutely nailing that fly when they, when they took it. Very, very aggressive take. Well, we've had an absolutely cracking day sport here at Ibrook on the dry fly. Uh, we started off up at Stoke Dry in the shallow water looking for real specimen fish. But then as the, the conditions changed, we dropped down into the, the slightly deeper water and did a bit of open water dry fly fishing. But finally, where we found most of the fish was actually on the drop off in that sort of 10 foot of water, just on the back edge of the weed beds, feed on all sorts of different food forms, but very happy to take a dry fly off the surface. All in all, it's been a spectacular day. And we'd just like to say a big thank you to Iva for running uh, such a fantastic fishery at Ibrook for us to uh, all enjoy.
successfully unhooked and as most brown trout I catch this one will be released to fight another day best of luck mate we're here in Barnhill Creek at Rutland we've seen several fish smashing the fry possibly browns just missed a good brownie before this one one or two starting to crash the fry now it's important to fish close to the edges the fish are cruising six seven yards out Nice and stealthy, single popper minky, sat there, wait for the fish to come to you. What a great time of year. Lovely Rutland rainbow, having caught a cracking brown this morning. A lot of cloud covers the fish to surface pop a minky. Sun's come out, so I put on a, a tandem weighted natural rabbit snake. Fished it maybe six, eight foot down, a lot slower. And uh, come up with this beautiful, lovely silver rainbow, probably two and three quarters, nudging three pound at best. We've come to Rutland looking for some big fry feeders. No better place than Barnhill Creek. Got a nice bit of shelter in here. It's quite a cold wind and it's quite blustery. So we've took a bit of shelter. You've got a nice uniform bank, a little bit of a ledge eight yards out and the fish tend to cruise in the margin. But what's key is we can see a lot of minnows jumping about. So where there's minnows, you're gonna get your classic fry feeding. And we've seen quite a few bashing the fry, some tight in, some 30, 40 yards out. We've kept on the move, we've worked the bank, we've rested it, we've changed methods, try and keep the fish steadily coming. That's quite important. Don't stand in one spot like a heron and hammer it. Keep on the move, keep changing your methods. We've caught on the popper mink is on the top when it's been cloudy. The sun's come out, it's now just gone, but when the sun's out, we've dropped down on chain-eyed snake lures, catching six to eight foot down. So keep the methods changing, keep on the move, but just watch where the seagulls are feeding, because that's where the fry are, and the fish are just below. Well, after a 4 a.m. start this morning leaving South Wales, I was really aiming for a big brownie. I've lost one big fish today and moved a couple of others. Ian's just got himself a lovely four pound fish on the, on the pop minky, so I thought I'd give it a try. But I didn't get, didn't get the brownie, I just got this big, fat, chunky rainbow. I was desperate to eat my pop of minky. So I move, put the little pop of minky on it and just left it there. He's just eating it static, beautiful. Well, I'm gonna put this guy back now. What a beautiful fish.
Well, I've just pulled into this little bay. Barry's on the other side. He's having a real good morning here with a load of fish in front of him, but there's no room for me. So I've gone in and I've created my own swim. I've just cut a few of the withies back, just push myself in, and these fish on this side of the, of the, of the little bay are really, really active and uh, haven't seen as many flies. Uh, they're actually fry feeding. Um, I know we've been throwing some uh, big stuff at them, but this one's just took a little flash, flashy uh, cormorant pattern with jungle cock cheeks. Cracking fish, probably three and a half pounds, and uh, real credit to Eleanor. So one of the big problems when you're fishing these sort of tight confined swims is that you get your flies caught in the withies, they're quite high, you're low in the water and trying to get your cast going can sometimes be a problem and then once you get caught up it's a nightmare, you've got to try and pull everything out. So what I like to do is when, when you've landed a fish or if you, you've just retied, instead of going into the swim straight away just lay your line out on the bank behind you and get yourself ready for a back cast. You can make the back cast, drop her into the water and then walk back into the swim into position and get ready to fish again. Done at Eleanor this morning, limited space because it's really busy, it's only been open a week so what we've tried to do this morning is make the most of our little peg that we've got. It's a little small area so we've, we've kind of fished it tactically. We've started with some big stuff, maybe a snake and a blob and it's noticeable how you got lots of takes very quickly and very very quickly it soon dried up. Then switched to a blob on a couple of nymphs and again they took the static blob but literally within five or six casts again everything stopped, stopped going tight. Then what we did for the next 10 minutes is switch to natural nymphs. Fish along the edge, but key to fish, absolutely static. Once you've done that, you just repeat and go back round again. We went back to the snake. Again, several casts, several quick fish. Very soon goes quiet. Also important to watch your monofilament. We dropped down from 11.2 to the 8.4 G5. Again, going finer and going smaller on the nymphs from 10s down to 12s. Although we've got a small peg in front of me, it's important that I maximise the water. What I've been doing is having five minutes casting to my right hand side, allowing the left and the middle to rest and settle. If I put one back to the left, normally I get a take pretty quickly. And again, I'll fish that five minutes, stick one back to the, to the right hand side, normally again, quick bit of action, it's been allowed to rest. Stick a couple down the middle, then back to the left. So rotate each piece of your bit of water in front of you to keep the fish coming.
Well, Mr. Bar, that was a good morning. Hey, up, Gareth. Trying to sort of funeral flays you? Yeah, try something scary and Larry. Yeah, I've gone the other way now. I can't yeah. get them on the big stuff. I've uh, I've had a funny old morning. It's been uh, a lot of changes of flies. A lot of changes have um, gone from down to single fly now. Yeah. I've actually, I finished off. You know, we catch a lot of fish in that corner, but a lot on a little size 12 cormorant. Yeah. Fished on its own. Let's give you one of these. It's important. Drop down to a single fly. There you go. Not many people th they think they need three or four flies. They've got more chances, but often it's the other way when it's been battered. Yeah, I think uh, between us, I don't know how many fish we've caught this morning, but you know we've obviously wised a few up. Um, and what I was finding as well is that there was like one or two little areas that were holding fish, and you had to really ignore those areas. You have to like leave them rest, then pop in a shot, catch one fish, and then you know catch your fish, and that was your chance. And yeah. then you go back to it, leave it another five minutes, rest it, one shot in, and always watching the line. Every take, they were starting to get a little bit twitchy on me, and as long as you just see that line tighten. Boom, and you get, yeah, you know, everyone was a, a coconut, so it was good, good nice. fun. Good, I like this. Yeah, I know, I like Thanks, that Mr. Jones. Yeah, well, Merry Christmas, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Early season fishing is often very fruitful, but it's still important that you think about what you're doing. Typically on a, a first spot, maybe start with something white and green, always really popular early season. Black and green and maybe a blob. Fish it through, nice and hard, nice and quick. You'll often get some very quick fish, but keep on the move. This time of year, the fish aren't active. They're looking, sitting in one spot, you've got to go and find those. So keep on the move. Just watch what everyone else is doing. If someone's rooted to a spot, often means they're catching something. Keep an eye on them. Go and perch on his shoulder. For next half hour, he's your best mate. Don't be afraid to ask what he's catching on. He's probably going to say black and green. After a little while though, when it warms up, just like today, the fish have gone off the big stuff, off the snakes, off the blobs, off the bright and gurry stuff, and they've gone on to more natural. We've caught a few fish on crunches. Gary's got a few on buzzers, and this nice little sexy cormorant thing he's got. So it's important to keep changing, but don't be afraid to go natural. It's starting to cool as the evening goes on, and for some bizarre reason they will switch back to the nice big gaudy lures. So just keep moving, keep changing your flies, keep variating the retrieve, and don't go wading straight in. Stand on the shore, because the fish this time of year are often right under your rod tip. Stay on the shore, be sure to catch plenty of fish. Well, a lot of you guys will have seen our hatch reels. Uh, they're the world's top selling premium reel at the moment. And what I'd like to do is just to explain to you what you're gonna get for your money. Well, the first thing you notice is the ultra lightweight. This thing is machined out of a, a very high grade aluminium. And you'll also notice it's got a very, very cool type two bead blasted finish. Very, very nice finish on the reel. So the one thing you notice is everything's very, very well machined. Uh, obviously it's got the nice porting, uh, which also reduces the weight but you'll notice little touches like you've got the the spool uh, knob which is all machined together you're not going to lose that part of the reel also inside you'll see that it's all fully sealed it's got nine separate drag faces in you so when you multiply those out they actually become larger than the size of the reel so you've got a very very smooth very very effective seal drag system You'll also notice that the reel seat itself has been machined into the reel. So there's nowhere for the little screws to build up any, you know, when you're in salt water and you get all that sort of corrosion. This thing is, is absolutely bulletproof. On the rear, you'll see there's a real nice convex uh, shape about it. Now that gives that, that spool a little bit more strength and a little bit more integrity. Now for me, the big reason for these reels is the smoothness of the drag. Okay, you can get away with most tackle when you're fishing heavy tippet. But if I'm on sort of 7X or, or sometimes on the river I'm on 8X, those ultra smooth drag systems just allow the fish to run without breaking the tippet. For a full information on our range of hatch reels, visit our website.
Kettle clean fish. Top lip on the buzzer just slides out. A little black buzzer with a orange holographic cheek. And again, another fish which is going to grow on and put on a couple of pounds, I'm sure. Well, after three years of top selling rod, a super stick took an upgrade this year. There's been a lot of advances in carbon technology and we've included them in this new model. One of the first things you notice is this barred cork area. What we've got is we've got a composite cork mixed with, with natural cork. So what you've got is you've got a, a, a flexible end section here, which isn't gonna wear. A lot of times you push your thumb into this section and you find a lot of wear in the old cork type handles. Whereas this composite doesn't wear away, but it's still got that nice feel about it. One of the things you'll notice when you pick up the rod is you're not gonna notice a massive difference in weight. But in my tests, we're getting about 10% extra strength out of the same physical weight. So the rods are a lot stronger, a lot tougher when you're out on the water. Another thing you'll notice is the colour. We've gone for a really subtle olive green this time around. I know a lot of people love the super stick colour, that bright red, but it really mixed people up. A lot of people would go, oh, I'm not fussy on it. So we've gone straight down the middle. We're going to give you a, a nice olive colour, something that's not going to upset anybody. We've got a high quality fit in throughout. You'll see there's some lovely uh, little finishes on it, a lot of nice detail. Real seat is, is really simplistic, but it's very, very functional. Lower down you can see we've got some real nice stripping guides that have been lined. And then higher up the blank you'll find they've got these single leg snake rings. Single leg snake rings are a real positive advantage. Firstly you've got only one lot of whipping, one lot of epoxy and they just reduce the weight so it makes the, the whole rods action that much more crisp and that much more responsive. Now the super stick comes in three piece sections. Uh, what you'll find is that there's uh, a rod in there for every different type of fishing you're going to find in, in UK still water. But what we've also done is we've developed a range of specialist four-piece competition rods. You've got a 10 foot 6 weight, 7 weight and 8 weight. And those guys are four-piece section rods and they've got a slightly more steel in the butt section. Just when you want to bully those fish into the net and get them in that a little bit quicker. Or if you're fishing from the shore and you want to cast that a little bit further, or if you want to keep a rod in the back of your car then you know the four piece is just that a little bit better for for traveling with all the improvements and refinements we've made you can see it's a real upgrade on what was already a fantastic range of fly rods well, we've had a great day here at Eleanor. it's really interesting water it's um it's that mix of both types you've got that small still water sort of feel to it but it's got a lot of um, a lot of the features of a big water where you've got fish feed on natural food you've got carixa you've got buzzer you've got damsels in the summer you know you it, it's got that real good balance here um, you can see all the way around the water so it's never really that daunting and if you see someone catching then you know the fish are in that part of the lakes this morning we were really lucky we found a a pot of fish feeding on fry, something you associate with the, the reservoirs in the back end, but this is early spring and those fish are just pushed up into the bay and really we were taking advantage of the of the coarse fish fry that were available to them. Well Alan has a two hour drive from my home and when I come to this part of the world I normally end up on Rutland or Grafham or, or Ibrook, but uh, I certainly will take advantage of the place this summer because I think it'll offer some fantastic dry fly sport on those nice summer's evenings. We've got three new fly lines in the airflow range that we're going to launch this season. Uh, the first line I'll tell you about is our Forge Salt. Based on the success of the Forge floating line in fresh water, we decided to launch a high volume, unridged floating fly line for general saltwater fly fishing. It's a much lower cost line than, than standard. It's looped at the front end and it's going to be a, a great seller in the saltwater market. Second line in the range is the Gulf Redfish. Now the Redfish um, is found in slightly different um, temperature range to your bonefish or your, your tarpon type 
type uh, scenario. So we've created a line with a slightly different mix of the materials. So it's a little less hard uh, and, and works better in a wider range of uh, temperature band. Uh, the taper design is also designed for a, a lot of those big flies you're going to be turning over with the, with the redfish. Finally, we've got the shovel head. And as the name suggests, it's a line for throwing big lumps of meat around. The line was designed by a guy called Kelly Gallup. Now Kelly's famous for his real huge articulated uh, flies that he chases big brown trout with in, uh, in running water. The line has got a very large diameter tip and it's designed to be fished with very short leaders to get your fly down as quick as possible right on that shoreline. So that's the other line. I think they may turn out to be a, a good pike fishing line, but uh, we'll see how it goes this year. Hi there. We're at Slandag with the reservoir. It's my local water. It's only about three and a half miles. Um, we're looking forward to a little bit of early season sunk line booby fishing. Well, we've had a lot of snow recently, and that's just pushed cold water into the, into the system. And we're expecting the fish to be deep. We're not expecting them to be too active this morning. Uh, so we're fishing two boobies, short leader. I've gone for an olive and a black. Uh, I probably should have an orange or something to drag them in. But I'll try this first, because they're my two favorite flies here. Well, today we've got relatively calm conditions, which are perfect for allowing us to get the flies really deep. You know, I'm looking at a 20 second count to get my flies down 15, 16 feet. Um, um, if the wind's up, obviously we'd put the drogue out and try to get a bit more control. Or if it's just too rough, just drop the anchor. If you're fishing at an anchor, you can fish a short section of bank, lift the anchor, drop down 30 meters, do the same again until you find those um, tight little pods of fish. Early season sunk line fishing, it's a real advantage to cast a long way. It's one of the only times I'll actually beef up my rods. I've gone for an 8 weight rod just to get my flies out as far as I can. The further you can cast, the more time it's got to get to depth before you're pulling the flies back up and out of the zone. I pay a lot of attention to the hang and find that a lot of those little bumps and pulls you get during the cast can be converted very late to the retrieve. Fishing various six sense lines, I find the sunk lines a huge weapon in the early season armory. Came up and took the took the point fly. You can see the, the orange just hovering six, eight inches down, and I just saw it slide away. So a lovely fish on the hang. First one on the hang this year. Again, keep it a fair way off you. Don't try and bully them into the net in a very short line. As you say, you just can't physically drag them that close. So leave a little extra yard outside, lift the tip up. Oops. There you go, and you got it. One of the things with this early season fishing is to give your flies a lot of different movement. What you normally find is that you can catch a few quick fish, but then they quickly become bored with the same old retrieve. So, count your flies down, make sure you get them down to depth, so you can have them fishing effectively. A lot of times I'll catch fish on the first few pulls. You tend to get a lot of fish either early in the retrieve, or later as the line changes angle, as the flies start to come off the bottom, and start coming back up to the surface and out of the fisher zone. So these are two key parts of the retrieve that you really need to key in on. I like to start the retrieve with a couple of pulls. This does two things, firstly it pulls the boobies down towards the bottom, and also draws the fish's attention and draws any fish in the area into the flies. Then I'll continue with a figure of eight retrieve or a series of pulls and twitches just to try and induce a take. Sometimes you'll find they want a series of long steady pulls and then every time you make that distinct pause as the line locks up, other days they want a faster. The secret is to mix it up until you find a retrieve the fish want.
Here's a quick tip for booby fishing or any fishing where you want to get a little bit more movement into your flies. I'd always fish them on a rapala knot. Being a loop knot, it gives the flies that little bit more movement during the retrieve. I can imagine every time I'm twitching that rod tip, that fly has heaps more wiggle. So for maximum movement, always use rapala knots. Perfect, yes. And he's on the olive and yellow. And there you go. I love the early season in clan egg with fish. At the minute they're about a pound and a half, pound three quarters, but it won't be long before they put on a bit of weight and they'll be out chomping across the middle and I'll be able to cast some dry flies at them. It's going to be a lot of fun this season. And what we have here is our new covert chest pack backpack combination. It's been really well thought out with no end of pockets which we'll show you in a bit more detail. On the front of your chest pack you've got a nice large pocket where you can put all your tippet materials and fly floaters and all the rest of it. And then on the front then you've got a nice large fly, fly patch which can just rest out and you can see your flies very easily when you're stalking those fish on the river. Now on the backpack you've got a well padded section here, number of large pockets, again sort of thing you can drop your, uh, your water bottle into or whatever you're going to have for, the, for your day out in the water. Finally, we've got a rod tube built in, so you can put a 9 foot 4 piece rod in so you've always got your spare with you on the water. I find it a lot early season, these fish are tightly podded, so you can go for a long time without the take, and literally like buses you get two at once. So I've got one on the top dropper, he can go back, and the guy on the point's a nice fish. Actually he's a little bit nicer fish. That one, well he can go back as well. Let's see what he'll be like at the end of the season. It won't be long till I'm throwing floating lines at you guys. Lovely job. There you go, back to fight another day. Well this is what I affectionately know as my nasty box. Um, big selection of different blobs um, and a lot of boobies, doubles, that kind of stuff. Early season, you've got to have something bright on. Got to have something bright in the top drop. Right? It's usually your, your drawn in fly. That'll draw fish into the cast. But today, the olive has been absolutely the star performer. I've got an olive booby with little yellow eyes on it. And in this water, I think these fish have been caught a few times. So even though the bright fly has drawn them in, it's the olive that they take in. And a lot of them will come in just so you lift up on the hang. And you see that little orange on the surface shoom, shooting away and. Uh, it's a great way to, to see the takes, I love it. We've had a wonderful day here at Land Eggwith. Obviously we'd like to thank the staff for, for throwing out the boats for us, it's been great. Um, the fishing has been typical early season fishing. The fish are still quite tightly podded and when you run into them, it's a fisher chuck. And when you don't run into them, there's nothing. So, you know, in another month or two's time, the fish are going to be up and charging around and there'll be a lot more fish in the water. But uh, yeah, we've had a great day. Thanks a lot. Well, it's good to see you again, Ian. Hi, Gareth. Yeah, not too bad, pal. Hey, uh, been a good year on the lakes for us, hasn't it? Not too bad, not yeah, too bad. Yeah. yeah, well, I had a brilliant time at Ibrook. Too bad you couldn't make it. Gutted. Yeah, no, no, I wasn't. I was, like, really pleased because I know when the pair of us in the boat together, we just kill us. You know, we just really want to put the flies right in the, on the button. And I had the shooting match all to myself. There were fish coming up, and I was just going, yeah. When the young's not going to catch, boom. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's always a competition, me and you. England versus Wales. Yeah. Uh, rising fish, who can get there first? Yeah, yeah. And there's usually six flights around by <laughs> the time they've even They've got, a, they've got an option. <laughs> no, it's all good. Hey, um, 
at Ibrook, like w when we did the film, obviously there's, there's a lot of information I've given out, which you know I feel is really important for dry fly fishing. But I know, look, you've got your own style on it and your own take. And there's any significant things you've got to throw into the pot for the for the viewers? Yeah, I, I think the biggest mistake a lot of people make, Gareth, is, is trying to chuck a long way. The fish are on dry flies because they're high in the surface. So the longer line you chuck, the more fish you're lining, so the sure. more fish you're scaring down. Yeah. So I will chuck a maximum seven, eight yards at yeah. most. Yeah. And the trick is chuck one there, chuck one there, chuck one there and repeat the process. Sure, Five, six sure. seconds, off, down, off, down. We um, search an hour. And nice it? and short. And then yeah. it brings the fish in. And you, I always keep spare line in the bottom of the boat. Because if that one does rise, yeah, I'm on it. Nail it. Brilliant, brilliant. And because you've got a short line, a lot of people, they're chucking 15, 20 yards of line. Mm. They see a fish and they're stripping back. You know, that fish is, is now five yards up the wind. They're chucking where the rise was. They've spooked all the fish that were potentially coming into their swim by the stripping. Yeah. They've chucked another 15, 20 yards line at that fish. The fish is five yards up. They've scared those and they've gone past that one. I always think as well, you know, when you see fish coming up the wind, <clears throat> there's a lot of times when you, you, you lose accuracy because you don't actually know the direction that fish is traveling well. And if you leave him come two or three times, you know 100% where he's yeah. going to be. You can put that absolute perfect shot in every time and you get the fish. Yeah. You know, if you try to cover him at 30 yards, look, I'm a decent caster, you're a decent caster, but we don't get it right to that distance. No. You know, it's when it comes in at 10, 5, you know, and just off that little corner of the boat and you just go, gentle little cast, yeah. from head and tail and you, you just get it. So having that, having that patience, let the fish come in a little bit closer. And at sure. 30 yards, there's a good chance you're not going to set the hook. Well, you're even on, if you do, on this. Uh, Every chance you're going to break off as well, yeah. you know. It's a uh, it's a lot of lot of uh, mm. distance between you and the fish. Mm. So I think keep it short. Yeah, no, I totally agree. We um, one of the things I've been developing this year is a, a real lightweight rod. Like for me, when I when I'm got a pledge today, I want to fish on my own. I really enjoy that element where I'm just one on one hunting old fish. You know, the fish that have been in the lake all mm. all year. So that's my that's what gives me the buzz. And what I've done this year is I've developed a nine and a half foot five weight in our Airlike V2 series. Something that's going to be really gentle on the tippet. So when I go down to, you know, four pound breaking strain, three pound breaking strain, and if, you know, if I have to, I'll go into two pound breaking strain. But the sort of stuff that I can just gently lift and not stand a chance of breaking. You know, if you go after those fish with a seven weight and you try to do what we're doing on the thin line, you just got no chance, you know. Mm -hmm. You're going to set the hook. Big overwintered fish is going to take off, and before you can get it on the reel, it's going to it's going to blow you up, you know. So and it's key. You mentioned sort of the, the lighter tippet, the softer tippet, the tip of the rod, the softer tippet in, in your, your leader material. It's yeah. getting that balance. It is. And you can't fish your four or five pound line with an eight weight competition rod that I would typically use. Yeah. And I do have some four or five weights, believe it or not. Yeah. And I have fished national finals using a four or five weight. Yeah. Out and out dry flies and five weight, five yeah. pound tippet. It's all about balancing up your kit for the situation. You know, if you do a good job of that, you're going to catch heaps more fish. Lighter line can mean more fish. I'm not going to argue with you there. Resident fish. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. A, any fish. I just think that when you start looking at lighter lines, I think there's two things that happen. Obviously, it's thinner, so it's less visible. But I also think that the way that it performs in the water, I think the suppleness is obviously a factor. You know, if you've got thinner line, it's going to be a lot more supple. And I think a lot of the presentation you get is, is far yeah. more natural. So, you know, I know it's always dangerous. It's on the edge, you know. It's, yeah. Do I go thin? Do I stand a chance of breaking off? But if you want to get takes, yeah. that's what you need to do. And I've proved the most minuscule difference, diameter in tippet makes a massive difference. Yeah. In France, in the World Championships, I fished two pound line Whoa. for wild brown trout. Mm. And I got refusal after refusal. And a good friend of mine, Stuart Crofts, come along with 1.25 pound. Yeah. He said, try this. And every fish come and nailed it. And you're talking 0 0.01 mil of a difference, but that micro difference made the big difference. Yeah, fantastic. So it, you know, for a, a three or four pound resident trout, going from six to eight pound down to four or five pound tippet will make that difference, and you will catch it. Yeah, definitely. We fished Ellen the other week, Gareth. We and, did. Um, we caught loads. We, we caught a fair yeah. Very quickly, but then it, did you notice how it slowed down? It did slow down a lot, and um, I think again going back to it, you know, we dropped down in smaller flies, we dropped down to single flies, we dropped down in tip of diameter. I think we turned into a couple of competition animals there because 
if I remember right, you'd already had five fish before we started filming. Yeah, you ro- you rolled up and I'd got four or five in, in as many casts and then we were back fish for fish. It was quite equal. Then you started to sneak ahead and I don't yeah. like getting beaten. No, I know, but uh, look, it was my turn to be a last year. It's your turn this year. You had a little bit of a flu. I'll give you the break. The other thing as well was I was being a bit sneaky because I could see what you'd done. You tried to do the sneaky on me, putting yourself into position. The only peg in the bay... The only peg where you could get to fish. And I thought, nah, I'm not having this. I'm going to go and create my own peg. You're also in jungle mode in the reef. Yeah, no, I did. I, I created my own peg and I cut you off for the pass. And effectively, the fish that you were catching were all to my right-hand side where you couldn't cast. Unless I was playing a fish, of course. So, yeah, no, I did go a little bit uh, spooky on you. And I noticed you, you went down to a single fly. I, I, I stuck with the team. I stuck yeah. with the... And th- this is a good lesson. So, I started with a candy blob and another blob and a nymph in the middle and I got fished very very quickly yeah then I started getting bumps and takes yeah. and taps and then nothing and you started the same but then you started catching at a very fast rate yeah and I was watching you as you're lifting off I couldn't see any droppers and I thought Mr Jones is on one yeah look it's a it's something I do a lot of you know when you're into fish where they're being pressured the fact that they've got three flies turning up and landing on top of them again and again and again well Stands to reason they go, three flies is a problem. Mm. One fly isn't a problem. And, and it also allows you to fish a longer leader because you haven't got to you know, worry about droppers running, fish a nice tight leader, cast it over them, and, and it lands a lot gentler. And as you say, you just concentrate on the hang. As we were coming up into the bushes there, I was just holding it and just watching the line every time we just go, eek, away, and just nail them. Mm. Um, it's certainly noticeable how my first seven eight ten fish all took the blobs yeah and then i noticed you catching a very fast rate so i yeah. kept one blob on the point always as an attractor to draw the fish in but then i put two nymphs quite close to that blob and the next five or six fish every single one picked out the nymph so it's clear that they'd gone off the bright stuff yeah but yeah. i still like to keep one on to draw the fish in well for me it was a case of well that water clarity had, had, had dropped down a little bit and what i find is something small and black always shows up you know you can have the blobs but the blobs generally work in the water that's a little bit clearer and the black will always stand out in that that dirty muddy water and it was it was it was absolutely key uh the other thing as well which was key was not kill the spot okay so i had a a pocket of fish which was i don't know maybe 10 foot square and the fish were cruising around this little 10 feet and the the secret to it wasn't to take them all out what you don't want to do is to go and catch one two three and then kill the peg what you want to do is you just want to drop it in, get one, be very happy that you've got one, work the rest of the peg, leave them a little settle, a little bit, then flick it back in. And every time you flicked it back in, as you did the little rotation, it would just lock up. So, you know, I it's watched, just it's just yeah. working the peg well, you know. I watched you, you fished it well. And you probably caught more than me that day. Yeah, that happens occasionally. It, it's rare, but it does happen. You, yeah, you certainly I'll, caught more. I, I'll put it down to your flu. <laughs> Thank you. No problem, yeah. Well, yeah, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, you know, we offer a lot of different sinking lines. And one of the questions is, when would you choose a 40 plus over a straight six cents over a sweep? Now, for me, if I'm fishing early season from the, from the boat, I always want to use a straight sinking line. I want to get down depth quickly and maintain it. And what I want to do is to get a real sharp angle on the way back up. So I want to keep down as deep as I can. If I'm off the shore, I always think 40 plus is better. Cast it further. You've got the angle of the bank itself, so it's shelving up, and the intermediate running line doesn't sink too deep under your feet. So, you know, you can control it. And then on the sweep, that's my sort of change line. So, you know, when you get into that season where the buzzers start to come off and a few insects start to, and you start to find fish through the water column. So I'm thinking, well, sweep lines, they come through the water column. If I get a take in the first three pulls, probably going below them for most of it. So I come up a line. Or if I'm getting fish on the hang, then maybe I need to go down to a full sinker. So, you know, that's that's my gauge on it. I'm just wondering how you yeah, gauge Yeah, very it. similar. So the sweep, we call it the searching line. Yeah. Because as you said, it comes through in a nice uniform U. So you cover the top layers, you cover the depth, and then you cover that sweep on the way up. And, and you mentioned the key point there. Where does the fish take the fly? At what point do you get the take? Is it early? If it's early, the fish are up. Right They're up on the, the wrong line. Yeah. You need to swap. Yeah, yeah. And, and often... People say, oh, he's on a die seven. 
But what they don't realise is that fish is took early and I've come off the die seven and I've come up to a, a fast glass or a, or a die three yeah. to keep the flies in the window. But the sweet is, is, the, is the perfect uh, searching line. Yeah. Uh, but indicate, think about where the fish is taken. Is it taken early? Is it taken halfway back? Is it taken on the hand? Because often people say, oh yeah, it took it halfway back. But they've not changed the line to keep the flies in that window. So you maybe come off the sweep yeah. and go on a straight seven or a 40 plus to hold the flies in that window of vision and the yeah. longer your flies are in that window the more chance you've got of catching the fish and that's the difference is keeping the flies in front of that fish as long as possible for that 40 yards or 30 yard cast yeah i'd have to say and the only time i really look at a 40 plus for for boat fish in early season is you know when you run onto a shoreline and a lot of times those fish are in that last five yards so i want to get a shot in before my boat partner hopefully get one before him then get another shot in then before we get having to pull the boat out and start again. You know, when you're on that, when you're running along a bank, it's no problem. But when you've got those short little drifts in, you know the fish are on that downwind shore and he's just working in and out. And I'm thinking, well, if I can put a 40 yard cast in there, I might sneak another couple out, you know? Very sneaky. I am. Well, I do the same. Yeah, no, I'm sure you do. <laughs> I'm sure you do. But you know, that that for me is the only time I really look for the 40 plus off the off the board. There is one every occasion I would use them in, in the high summer. Okay. Uh, when you've got a big wind on, the boat's pushing really quickly. You want the maximum distance yeah, yeah. to allow the maximum sink, you know, the maximum depth, or that maximum time to allow it to get down to okay. the bottom. So that 40 yards, maybe a little sneaky bit of backing in a big wind. Yeah, yeah. Hit the deck as fast I can't as I can. cast that far. I can't say I've noticed. <laughs> well, Ian, there's been a lot of talk recently about declining angling numbers. And I really think it's time that we all started to support our our local fisheries you now even if we could all go one more trip a year it'd make a big difference to the numbers of waters are going to stay open personally i got heavily involved with my local fisheries land egg with it's been somewhere i fished for the last 25 30 years and uh, we found out this winter that it was going to close and uh, we got all of the management told them what we were going to do what we could do to help them what they could do to help us and thankfully we're going to get the next 12 months with a stack full of fish in there and hopefully we can get the angler numbers up. I'm sure you've seen it in your local waters. You know, anything that we can do to get more people fishing, I think is is critically important. It's, it's true because you've you've seen Chew Valley was at risk. Sure, uh, that's been saved, and it, you need to support your waters. You know, you can see people on social media; they write about it. But unless you're there, paying your permit, supporting that fishery, they are going to going to close. And and I've seen it from when I was a kid at Rutland. You know, we talked about it, and you've got. Four o'clock in the morning, I'll be nudging my dad, come on, dad, I want to go fishing. And there'll be all these little lights along the bank. I know. And you can appear on these big reservoirs now, and not just Rutland, not Grafton, but Chew, and that you can have them almost to yourself. It's, it's incredible, but we've got to get there and vote with your feet and bring a friend along. You know? yeah. You've got yeah. a child, bring your child along, bring, exactly. your, bring your neighbor, bring your mates, yeah. get them into it, because what a sport. Yeah, I know. It's, well, look, what have we done for the last how many years, I would like to say, but you know, it's really, really something that's deep in my blood and I really want to be able to do it for the next 20 years. Mm. And unless we all get behind it and have a cohesive mm. approach, then I fear that it might not be there in the next 10 years. So, you know, all you guys, you need to go out and do a bit more fishing. Yeah. Drag the children off the Xboxes. Get, get them, them off the there. Playstations. Get them out there. Get them take fishing. Take them fishing. Take them fishing. Brilliant. Well, yeah, I had a good year on the competition scene, but I don't think it's another angler in the UK who had a better year than you did. I guess you're really lucky again this year. Eh? Oh, my, my luck certainly didn't deserve me last year, Gareth. Yeah. Um, it started with a brown bowl on the Lake of Menteith. Brilliant, well done. And Scotland has been really kind. Three major tournaments, brown bowl on Loch Leven, which was nice. Yeah. Certain world title in 2009 with the team championship gold as well. And the brown bowl again on the Lake of Menteith. Well done. Um, cracking fishery, cracking sport, but major, major success and, and I really enjoyed that brown bowl for the second time. I bet you did. But the one that's eluded me all these years is the Trout Masters. And okay. Russell Hill of Trout Fisherman, he loves to remind me, you've never won my competition. So that was one I was, I was wanted to put right. So Brilliant. on Drake last year, uh, I put in a day's practice, found a few fish, set the methods, gained a lot of it was tight, close fishing, some dry, some nymphs, some yeah. snakes, a bit of everything. Uh, and I managed to, to pocket that once, which was probably the biggest relief in all my competitions. You know, well, I've won world titles, but this one, because I've been reminded so much, it was nice to just get that final one in the bag. Uh, great competition, you know, some great anglers of all, all levels, all abilities, 
so it was really enjoyable. And then we had the, the Angling Water Team Championships, which yeah, is well. is the FA Cup of no, fishing. I know all about that. It was the first year we hadn't qualified in maybe yeah. 10 years. So it's, it's the one we wanted to win. It's the one everybody wants to win. We all want to win the Angling Water. Yeah. And uh, I've got three new guys in the team, youngish lads, brought them on and they were super. They're keen and they're so hungry. Uh, and we managed to get that. So yeah, a really lucky year. Yeah, you were lucky on the big fish as well. I always get lucky. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I know we had a we had a session on the bank in Rutland, and we had a few nice fish. But you know, we were both looking for that that absolute lump. I know I lost the <laughs> lost the big guy. I don't think it was as big as the one you had, but uh, certainly a good fish. Well, Tell us a bit more about the the big brownie you had. Well, what I did after so we had some good fish when we were on there, but I sneaked back a week later. Yeah. Um, it got a bit colder. The fry had come in. The fish were pounding them. Okay. And. It was a bit lucky again, I got lucky again. I got a bit of a knot in the back of my line, so I untangled this knot and I picked up the tension in the line. Everything was rock solid. I was on the bottom, so I gave it a heave and it started to move. And I thought, this is a big pike. Yeah. And then it came to the surface, my first double figure Rutland trout in 35 years. Wow. 10 pound, two ounces. Isn't it interesting sometimes that those big fish, having seen all the flies that they're going to see, mm. retrieved every time you do something silly like that and and i, I see i've seen it a lot of the years where people who are new to the sport or perhaps you know not as you know proficient have done something a bit silly and they've caught those real big fish just knocked them off so maybe yeah. me and you need to stop being so proficient yes but i believe that there's dead fry they're going to drop to the of course bottom. yeah no it makes yeah. total and sense it's been out there 90 seconds in yeah 10 12 foot of water yeah that humongous must have been on the bottom. It no must doubt. have been, and yeah. I think it's picked them up. And you mentioned something there about beginners that do odd things and stuff. And it reminds me of fishing static. Yeah. Now, this humongous was static on the bottom. It's a dead fry. It's picked it up because they feed on the dead stuff. That of sits course, on the yeah. They pick it up and it swam off of it. As soon as it got the tension, yeah. this thing was on. And how often do you you throw something and you talked about retrieve? The fish see it. They see this robotic retrieve, as I call it. And then you make torches, you turn around you, and, you, and your line shoots away because yeah. you've stopped moving the fly. Yeah. And those little things are little signals to how the fish actually want it. Yeah. Oh, as I say, it's been a fantastic year for yourself and a fantastic fish to end it. So well done. Yeah, thank you.